Welcome to Founders Uncut, the podcast that goes beyond the romanticized founder journey to discover the moments of vulnerability and doubt that even the most successful founders face. I'm Maria Palma, general partner at Kindred Capital. Here with me today is Clara Odero, who has been an employee at three unicorn companies, Flutterwave, Rapid, and Neom, and is now founding her own company, CredRails, doing open banking in Africa. If you think her journey was easy, I assure you it wasn't. The startup journey is never the easy, straightforward path it appears to be from the outside. So let's dig a little deeper and uncover the real story in Founders Uncut. Startup years can be like dog years, so being on three unicorn journeys is next level. Let's hear how that helped Clara grow as a person. What was each of the three companies you were at, and what is a learning that you had from each of those experiences? Flutterwave, um, an African unicorn, um, Rapid, which was out of London, and Neom, um, out of Singapore. So at Flutterwave, I learned the importance of enterprise clients for scaling your business quickly. At Rapid, I learned the importance of hiring the best to build the best. And you can see that in how the valuation has jumped so quickly. And at Neom, I learned a combination of those things that team, product, and a really empathetic leader are important in building a business people will want to join. Yeah. And how do you, if you look back on the journey, you know, I think that it's always about the people and do you build the right culture for them? So as you're a founder now, like how do you instill a good culture from day one? You decide what kind of company you want to be. You set the standard and you have to hold yourself to that standard. So for example, one of the things at my company, Credrails, is you have to keep your word. If you say you're going to do something big or small, be it to a client, be it to your teammate, you have to keep your word. We have to be honest even when we don't like what we have to say. Those kinds of things and living it myself. So even when I have something I don't want to say, I have to say it. I have to keep my word to people. If I say we're shipping on this day, we're shipping on this day. No excuses and being honest. Got it. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing now with Credrails? All right. So Credrails is building open finance rails for Africa. Um, we want to connect bank, mobile money, SACOs, which are also called stock veils or SUSUs, depending on what part of Africa you're in, into a single API and exposing that to a variety of businesses through different um, use cases. There's lending, there's KYC, there's possibly payments. But right now we're focused on lending as a use case. Great. It's very exciting. Yes. I'm a big believer in the company, as you yes. know. Um, as you think about this, this is your first like founder experience, right? Yes. You've seen the journey other times. What has been positively and negatively surprising about being a founder? The most positive thing is that people want to come work for us and the best people want to come work for us. Finding talent has been one of the most amazing things. We have built a superstar team and that these people want to come and work with me on this makes me get up every day. Yeah, I love my team. Um, the most surprising thing was actually how hard it is to fundraise. Mm-hmm. I expected it would be easier, especially with my background, um, but it's, it's difficult. I understand the stat now that just 2% of um, female founded companies do get VC funding. I see it now. Mm. Yeah. So when you see a stat like that, right, you know, how does it make you feel? Do you get intimidated or, you know, does it like, how do you feel going into fundraising knowing that unfortunately that is the stats right now? I think there are a variety of ways to think about it. I personally look at it like I still have to get it done, so oh well, it is what it is. Um, I'm going to be part of that 2%, not that I'm going to be outside of that. So you just have to keep getting the work done. I'm the kind of person who I think feels that I'm an exception to the rule, and that's how I like to go through life, go th- work through life, thinking that I'm an exception to the rule. But so far, it's, it's, not, been, it's not been the easiest thing, yeah. Yeah, I think it, you're not alone by thinking that fundraising is hard, so if it yeah. makes you feel better. Um, and I was just talking to a founder the other day who, who said the best, best advice for fundraising is just build a good company. So I, I think it's probably a, a good way to think about it for yeah. sure. Um, any advice kind of in the early fundraising days for people who are doing their first round, things you kind of wish you knew earlier in the process that you're, you're now thinking about? Um, I think that we did a lot of things right. We bootstrapped to get to this point, so we had customers, traction, partnerships um, before we started fundraising. I think the mental prep is actually what I wish I'd done better. Um, Assume it's going to be hard and get yourself in that headspace that it's going to be hard. 
um, to kind of like mentally pre prepare yourself for how long it might take or how difficult it is. A lot of people don't tell you how long it takes them to fundraise that you just see an announcement and you think, oh, well, this happened in such a short time. And everyone tells you about these rounds where people closed in a day, two days a week. Um, that's not the reality for a lot of founders. And I think that people should also acknowledge and be more truthful about the fact that, hey, a couple of companies that are now very large took a very long time to fundraise. Yeah, I'm actually really glad you said that. Being a VC, I actually see this firsthand. Like there are deals that get done in a matter of days. It does happen, but it is literally not the vast majority of cases, right? There's a lot of rounds that take longer, have a lot more introductions, and I think that it's um, you, when you see the press release, it's just not the same thing, right? It just looks like this easy, easy thing that happens in the background, but yeah. it's not like that. Yeah. Um, on the talent side, I'm so excited about your superstar team. How do you like because you've seen multiple different companies now? Your bar for talent is probably calibrated to some extent, but can you give advice to someone who's on their first go around? Like, how do you know if you're really hiring the best talent? I think you need to hire people who are smarter than you. Um, you need to hire the best. And this is difficult for a lot of founders because they want to nickel and dime when it comes to paying. Pay for good talent, but make sure you're paying for actual good talent, if that makes sense. Don't have someone BS you that they're good. Like, look at their past experience, speak to a couple of people, and pay them what they're worth. I can guarantee you that paying people what the good people what they're worth is going to exponentially grow your company more than it is paying an average person to do an average job. Like keep the bar as high as possible in all things to do with your company. You've lived multiple places. How did you decide where to find Crad Rails and how did you end up deciding to get onto this journey? Um, so because I've lived in multiple places, I was looking for roots. Um, so I bought a house and while buying the house, um, my bank was asking me for so much information. I was just like, come on, there's some kind of asymmetry here that we can bridge the gap through data with. So it was, OK, how do we get everyone's information into an API, expose that to lenders so there can be cheaper loans, more people accessing loans, not just income or asset based financing? Those kinds of questions. Um, as to how I decided, it was a couple of things. Um, where did I have the most advantage? So that was definitely, there was a home ground advantage, plus there was no one who was doing this in Kenya. And um, I want to be the first Kenyan unicorn. And that's important to me, a sense of national pride. Um, so that, that was the other thing. Then both me and my co-founder are Kenyan, though our CTO is um, from Mozambique. Um, speaking about Kenya and the continent of Africa, I'm involved in a nonprofit, as you know, called African Entrepreneur Collective, and they've done an incredible job of building talent locally in Rwanda and Kenya. Mm -hmm. But actually, a lot of other companies that I've seen on the continent really export talent in. How do you think about that as you build the company? You know, is there enough talent for you to, to hire in the startup scene? Is, is there a talent earth? You know, what, tell us what it actually looks like. So, I do think that there is talent. That's the first thing. I'm proof of that. My team is proof of that. There is talent. The thing is, it might not look like what you expect it to look like. So your management talent might not be someone who's worked at multiple startups. It might be someone who's coming from a traditional career and moving into startups. So you've got to be open and think about transferable skill sets and be very clear as to what is transferable, what's not. I think also hiring people with a learning mindset helps. But the talent does exist because there are all these businesses on the continent, multinationals, they've been hiring for years from the continent, so the mm -hmm. talent does exist. How do you interview for a growth mindset and a learning mindset? Hmm. Um, how open are people to receiving new information, to receiving feedback, to receiving criticism? Um, ask people to tell you about how they learn, like what's the What's the best thing they've learned like in the last few weeks? And if it takes, a lot of people get excited about mm. like their hobbies and stuff like that. And you can see that, okay, this person is like really into this thing and they really enjoy learning. I think those kinds of conversations are how I realize if someone has a learning, a growth mindset. I think that's the most, being curious will take you very far in life. So I just look for people who are eternally curious. Nice, eternally yeah. curious. I think you can't go wrong with that. Um, I'm curious because you said wanting to be the first Kenyan unicorn, which I also hope you will be. Um, mm -hmm. What does your family think of that? Are they excited about this journey? Do they think you're crazy? What do they think? Can I just tell you that I don't think my parents know what I do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, I think my mother just knows I make money and clearly I'm not depending on them for anything. So I don't think she really knows what I do. Um, my sister does because my sister works um, with an accelerator for social enterprises. So she understands it and she's very supportive. Um, but I think that my family has learned to just let me be in the sense that I figure it out. My mother told me recently, you're a smart girl, you'll figure it out. And that's generally the support that I get from my family. You'll figure it out. I have no doubt you'll figure it out. There's a good trait for founders, right? Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you ended up getting into startups at the beginning? Yeah, so I had a whole other career where I used to sit behind a computer and calculate um, carbon credits, so emission reductions for clean cook stoves. Yes, just as glamorous as it sounds. Um, and I, I hit like a glass ceiling because international development is very white and I would never get past middle management. So I decided I wanted to go to business school with the aim of changing careers. So I wanted to go to business school, then possibly become like a consultant at McKinsey and things like that. So I applied, got in, and then around the same time, I got the chance to go and consult for a startup in Nigeria. So I'd gone to Nigeria once or twice for business for the social enterprise. I didn't really know anyone, but like I really enjoyed the country. I was like, I want to move, I want to move. Um, and then this chance came. So I quit my job um, for what was going to be like a six week consultancy. I got to Nigeria. Um, the consultancy did not end up being a full time role. I had to find a job in two weeks. Um, I knew one of the Flutterway founders and he introduced me to the other. And he, our first meeting, he came in, he was like, I follow you on Twitter. I was like, oh, okay. Um, and we had a really good conversation. He was like, I want you. What is it going to take for me to get you? Um, and that was the start of my fintech career. Well, I think they and we are all glad that you took that step. As am I, yes. So thinking through the journey of the three different unicorn companies you were at before this, mm -hmm. you know, how did you change as a person throughout that journey? Um, hmm. I'm a lot more resilient. I think that that's the one thing startups have taught me how to be resilient because things don't work out one as fast as you think they would because my job was partnerships, bank partnerships and regulatory stuff. So dealing with governments is never fast, no matter where you are in the world. So um, learning to take my time, but also try and get the results I want has made me more resilient having to go through plan A, B, sometimes all the way up to Z, has made me more resilient. Um, and generally more curious. I think that at Flutterwave, I learned resiliency. I learned how to just like roll with the punches, how to speak to customers, what customers want to hear. At Rapid, it was all about learning because they brought in the best of the best folks that had worked at PayPal, Grab, to come and build this company. And it was just about absorbing all of this, right? It was a chance to understand what made global companies work from people who actually did the building and that was amazing um at neom i think the thing i've learned most is leadership um the ceo is legitimately one of the best people i've ever encountered cares about people cares about product just leads with empathy if there was a business case study as to what effective leadership looks like, it would be that, but he's actually a case study, ticks all those boxes. So um, those, those are the things I say. Tell us together. more about him. What does that look like in the day to day? Right? I think there, there's a lot of people who work for horrible managers and good leaders. Like to work for someone so incredible, like, what does that actually look like day to day? So I've had bad managers. So I think that's also part of being able to recognize what a good one is. Um, it's setting your expectations, being very clear as to what those expectations are, following up with people, offering to help, but letting them do their thing. Let people fail up. Well, let people fail, but also let people rise to the expectation. I think people do well when you expect the best of them, right? Like you're bringing out the best in a person by saying, I believe you can do this. So he's that kind of person. Um, it's little, little things that aren't little things. So like they just raised and put that money back into the ESOPs, like bought the ESOPs. Mm. So people who started from the beginning get a stable future. I've never seen that happen because most people just keep taking the money, keep taking the money, keep taking the money. Very few people like bring it back into the company. 
Um, it's things like even secondaries. A lot of times, it's just founders. It's not the whole company that gets to have the upside of that. Yeah. Exactly. And so people who were there from the beginning get to experience the upside, and that upside was coming after a global pandemic, mm -hmm. right? That had shattered so many lives in India, especially where there's a huge part of Niam's workforce. So I thought that was such a good thing to do, in the sense of it was rewarding the people who were there from the very beginning. It was making them feel valued and seen and also giving them um, stability during a generally unstable time in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, what else do I really like? The ability to hire smart people and have smart people want to come work for you and listen to those smart people. Um, the CRO is this guy who worked at PayPal. Um, his name is Frederick. I really enjoyed working with Frederick. And he's very smart, very, very, very smart. And I think it is a mark of a good leader to be able to have people like that want to come in and help mm -hmm. you build your vision. Um, also, very open culture. Everybody, we have these, we used to have all these all hands and speak about what's happening in the company, answer all the questions. Nothing's filtered. The questions are in real time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't, aren't that open about their company and what's going on and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the ESOP for a second, because one of the things I've been super surprised by since I moved from New York to London is that in London and the UK, there's a lot of like the ESOP understanding of employees. It's very similar to the US, but actually outside in broader Europe, country to country, there's a lot of differences in like, does the employee base understand what ESOP is, how valuable it is, if they can make money from the equity? What is it like in Africa? Do people understand what they, that they should have ESOP and like, do they, do they understand what that looks like? It's starting to get better just because they're more successful companies. So the more companies become successful, the more people will understand the upside of joining a startup is the ESOP, right? You take a pay cut generally, especially if you are in management at uh, mm -hmm. an MNC, you'll take a pay cut, but then your ESOP should be worth X. So you're working towards that. Um, yeah, I think there's a greater understanding, definitely in pockets so South Africa, Nigeria, maybe Kenya to a small extent. But when I'm negotiating with people, yes, they do understand it. And is the ESOP typically given to everybody in the company? Is that standard practice also in Africa? Or is no. it just given to certain management? It really, it's really dependent on the founder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I'm trying to think. No, there isn't. It's just it's really dependent on the founder and, and team and all of those things and what their board does. Um, and then also, I think the most important thing is that there haven't been that many success stories for ESOPs to matter that much yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair. Um, being a founder is such a hard mental journey. Yes. You know, where do you go to refuel yourself? How do you actually keep your own kind of mental health through the journey? Therapy. Um, I've had a therapist for a while. So definitely speaking to my therapist as I go through this. And then having gone to therapy for a while, I have strategies to cope. So it's like when I realize that I'm burnt out, it's okay to take a break. Um, what are the things I do to refuel? I'll read a book. I'll go out on a walk. I'll spend time with my family. Um, so definitely therapy and the coping strategies that I learned throughout years of having therapy. Um, that's, that's, that's basically it. And just like speaking to other people who are doing similar things. So I have a friend who's always like, keep your head in the game. You've got to do this thing. Like you said, you're going to do it and you're a person who keeps your word, so do it. Yeah. And um, if you think about the continent, it sounds like there's a few ecosystems that are really burgeoning. But if we fast forward, I don't know, 10, 15 years, if you're talking to a five-year-old little girl or little boy um, in Africa right now, what do you think the tech scene looks like there in 10, 15 years for those people? Um, here's what I hope it looks like. I hope it looks like a lot more people going into technology. I hope it looks like um, a lot more people having exited from successful businesses and had the base, the, like the monetary base to take risks and start their own companies. I think that's the most important thing. What an ecosystem that's successful does is allow people the freedom to take risks. And one of those risks is starting a company. So I hope there's that. I hope that they're able to see our own versions of successful companies. And when I say our own versions, I want to be very clear. African-founded, African-led um, companies, because what does happen is that um, people move to the continent 
for various reasons to be more interesting to start a company because they seem like it's an easier market or so on to be a big fish in a small pond um, and I don't think those people have an understanding or a how do I say this uh, roots right and and so the upside is short term if that makes sense for them versus for the ecosystem so i want more people who are invested in the ecosystem to rise up and be mm -hmm. the success stories be the face of the success as well yeah. yeah well i also hope for that same future um it's also interesting it's it's a, in any market i think if you're going to do something like you're doing which is ties into banks and data and privacy like if you don't understand the cultural realities and you don't have deep ties to a place, it must be really hard to negotiate bank contracts or you know, understand what users might do. Right, and then people will hire local talent. Um, and I hope that local talent is well compensated and so on. But it does uh, bring up a good question if people can come into a region they don't understand and build big companies. Time will tell. You probably, I mean, it was probably easier for you to meet VCs. It's never easy to fundraise, but you've already been on a number of startup journeys that you at least kind of have some understanding of VC and probably know some VCs before you even started this round. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's like literally never met another venture capitalist and their founder? What is the best way to get in front of a VC? It's honestly a warm introduction. I hate to say it, but you have to know someone who knows someone um, because then they will give you the time of day. It's people vouching for people. So I would say people in your position should go out and start building those kinds of networks so you can vouch for people like you have vouched for me. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's having yeah. people reaching out to people to vouch for you. I think it's a really important place. Actually, Dell from Backstage Capital talks about it and like the, the how warm introductions is actually such a hard or such a downside for diversity and inclusion right. in venture. Right. But at the same time, I think one thing that is encouraging is that sometimes you can get, I feel like warm introductions seem like if you don't already have the network of VCs, you can never get them. But like we met for coffee, whatever, three or four weeks ago. Yeah. And so like you can always build relationships, right? Yes. I think even personally when I went into venture, I think I met half a venture by getting declined by funds and not really understanding what a venture was until I met um, the firms that I actually ended up going to work for. But yeah. I think that, yeah, I guess it, if, if, if as long as the warm introduction culture purveys, which is the reality, um, I think you have to probably get in front of some people. But. but even when you think about other relationships, like um, when people are dating, the best kinds of dates are, hey, I know a f I have a friend who's single, I have a friend who's single, let's bring them together. Or if you're looking to hire someone, you'll tell me, um, do you know anyone who's good at ABCD? That's just the nature of the world. I think that what we need to do is then create a pipeline, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. for those warm introductions to happen for people who would not necessarily have access. Yeah. I think that's the thing, not just doing away with the culture, because it's never going to go away. Yeah. No, I actually, I agree. I think there's like, there's a, a world we wish we live in, and then there's a world we live in, and then it's dealing with that. And I actually think you're right, right? Like people in my position are and should be accountable um, for these things. And I know we both are um, knowledgeable about the Emerge program that SoftBank and Speed Invest and Kindred and a bunch of us are doing, but I think that there, it's important to put underrepresented founders in touch with VCs when they're fundraising, but it's also important to just create social ties with people that don't naturally come across like through your own network of friends or through people who look like you, because by definition, you probably end up getting to know people in a similar socioeconomic status or a similar background by virtue of where you grew up. And so if you're not very like open and deliberate about building those networks, yep. and, and I think the socialization is important, right? Because it's not just about the moment when you're fundraising, it's about having access it's Earlier. relationships. Everything yeah. in life is about building relationships. I worked in bank partnerships and it's relationships. The best partnerships I've ever been able to execute on were where I got to know the person, mm -hmm. right? And I know about your children, I know about that. And I see you as a person and not just what you can do for me. Mm -hmm. um, getting that access, I can tell you, is difficult because how many people can fly to London and have their meetings? How many people can fly to San Francisco and have their meetings? Um, and face to face is always better, but I I don't have the answer generally as to how we increase that pipeline. But I know that the thing is for me, who's inside, I need to leave the door open for other people. Also, make warm introductions. Mm -hmm. um, also, make sure that when funds are coming onto the continent, they are hiring the right people. Don't hire someone who doesn't really understand the continent, isn't from the continent. Um, yeah. 
those are the things that I think matter, matter a lot. You mentioned getting on a plane to London, SF, but yet we are living in this like Zoom moment, right, where everyone's now global on Zoom. Do you think that actually makes it more equitable and more people will get access to venture, or do you think that it's um, that it, it still comes back to building relationships in person? Um, I think because the world is opening up, we're going to move back to building relationships in person. That's just how yeah. it is, um, needing to be in the room. Yeah. Yeah. And your best advice for building a relationship is just to get to know someone as a whole human and not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I spoke to people like yesterday um, where we were talking about what it's like being immigrants and what it's like to not feel like you have a sense of stability. And yeah, she's a VC, but like we were having a human conversation about what it's like to always feel like you have to have a plan B in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those kinds of things. And I think that when you approach relationships from that aspect, it's a lot easier for it to be organic and it's a lot easier for people to go like, hey, that's a person that you should know. Um, yeah. And if you think back on, when did you found the company again? Um, last year. Okay. Yeah. In that last year, what has been like the most frightening or scary moment that has happened so far? Feeling we might run out of funds. Yeah. Yeah, that's been the scariest thing ever. You kind of can't come back from that. Right. Uh, but then that's where um, ESOPs mm -hmm. help. That's the only way we've been able to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so calling in the cash. Yeah. yeah. And what's been the absolute best moment? The team. The yeah. team. We've persevered to get to this team. And it fills me with so much pride that these people work building a dream that I have and it's now part of their the team is the best part the best part I have the smartest people working with me to build this yeah that's incredible I yeah. think that's how everyone wants to feel yes. um and now that you're on the founding side do you think you'll ever not be a founder or is, is this one of many companies or or is it too early to say I do think this is one of many companies but I also think I'm going into VC to address the challenges we've just spoken about yeah Okay, well, I can't wait for all of those chapters. Um, thank you for the time. I'm going to end it with one last question. Yes. But um, speaking to, you've been incredibly successful. And um, we as hope. we said, the stats for, for females or underrepresented people in general is just not great for a lot of things. What advice would you give to someone who's graduating right now? What should they go and do? Um, I would say join a tech startup. I think join a tech startup before Series A is the best advice I would give anyone. What looks like it's going to go up. But I'd say invest in your skills. Um, realize what you're good at. Invest in that. Um, look at how that skill can be transferred. Get experience. Um, don't come in thinking that you're going to know how to solve a problem. Actually get experience solving the problem before you try and trade your time for money. So I think when you're graduating, you have like a lot of time and you won't have a lot of money. Spend that time getting better at stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like you get paid less, but hone your skill set. In time, the money will come, the opportunities will come, but just make sure you're ready when that happens, that you're the best in class when people come. Yeah, it's actually so refreshing to hear you say that because I think a lot when people talk about career transitions and what should they do, it's always like, what is the transition? How do I navigate that moment? Or how do I network or whatever? But it's also like, do the thing well, right? Like if you do something well, usually yes. when you look up, there's opportunities, right? Yes. I think that's a good, yes. just yes. be good at something, whatever that is for you. And then be the best. Don't just be good. <laughs> like there's, there's good people everywhere. Be the absolute best. You've got to be best in class to get best yeah. in class opportunities. And how do you know when you're the best? Like, what, what, do you, like, what do you have to do? Is it just hours? Is it the kind of 10,000 hours to be an expert? Or do you have to, like, surround yourself with people better, push yourself? Like, what is the journey? I think it's push. I think the first thing is self-awareness. A lot of people think they're better than they really are. So there's a self-awareness as to what you're good at, where you need to improve. Um, domain expertise. And when I say expertise, I... I mean actual expertise, not I've worked on a problem for two months and mm -hmm. therefore I understand it. Study under the grades, like it's an, in I think life is an internship. Hmm. Work under people who've done the thing that you want to do and learn from them. Um, and then look at, again, be very self-aware and look at yourself objectively versus the person you're working under. Where are you in terms of skills? So when I get a new job, whatever the role is, I always write down a list of things I want to learn. Then I look back every couple of months, have I gotten mm -hmm. to this level? Have I gotten to those, that level? That kind of self-awareness and constant self-improvement yeah. helps you become the best. Yeah, and feedback, right? I think 
That is, I love that. Life is an internship. Um, one of my favorite quotes is, life is not about finding yourself, it's about creating yourself. Yes. Um, and I think, I've, I don't know how you think about this, but imposter syndrome is something I think everyone deals with. Um, and I think there are moments where it's like crippling and then you have to deal with it in a very different way. Mm -hmm. But if it's not in a crippling moment, but just like kind of those moments of self-doubt or like imposter syndrome, like, am I, am I good? Am I good enough? Et cetera. I feel like I've been think I've been reframing recently. I think those, they used to make me more nervous and uncomfortable. And now I'm like, if you're not feeling that to some degree, you're kind of not in the right spot, right? Like you want to be surrounding yourself with people who are better than you. You're learning from your challenge. And so you kind of like, it means you're growing in a way, if that makes sense. Or you challenge never yourself. want to always be the best in a room. Yeah. You never, you never want to be in a room and you're the smartest person there. Totally you never agree. want to be in a room where you're the most experienced, that you're the one who can lead the conversation all the time. One, it gets boring. Two, you start to think of yourself way more highly than you should. Like you become an asshole. So you need to be constantly learning, constantly thinking about it. When imposter syndrome is crippling, I always think it's a Nigerian saying, do they have two heads? Like we're all created basically the same way. If they can figure it out, I can figure it out. I love that. Yeah. Um, so basically you have to surround yourself by people who are better than you to also become the best. Yes. Um, thank you so much for your time and all of the great learnings and excited to see where you go from here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Clara, so much for being with us here today. And we'll all remember to keep being the best. If you want to see more of what she's up to today, go to credrails.com. And for more stories like this, go to kindredcapital.vc forward slash founders uncut. And as always, if you're a founder and the journey is hard, you're not alone and you're not doing anything wrong. Being a founder is just hard. Even the most successful founders face fear, doubt, and unbelievable difficulties that never make the headlines. Thanks for being with us today. And if Clara's story resonated with you, join us again on Founders Uncut.